Hello and welcome to this ICME Global Awards 2021 webinar. My name is Mara Kefalopoulou and I'm ho your host for today's presentations. The ICME Global Awards celebrate chemical process and biochemical engineering excellence and are widely considered as the world's most prestigious chemical engineering awards. Today we will be revealing the winner of the ICME Innovative Product Award sponsored by the Chemical Engineer. This award recognizes the best product to originate from the chemical and process industries in the last three years. Our awards judging panel has been working hard in recent weeks to review and rank all of the entries, and here are our finalists. Clean Tech Water, Dow USA, Dow Republic, two entries from Johnson Mathy, a joint entry from Chezang High Matter New Materials, Ninbo University, China, and University College London. And finally, Saudi Aramco. All our finalists have been invited to join us today to tell us more about the work and answer your questions. You can get in touch throughout the presentations using the GoToWebinar questions box on screen. So let's get started with our first finalist. Representing Clean Tech Water, it's Jonathan Wright. Hi there, uh, welcome to our webinar. Um, we're very happy to have been shortlisted as finalists for both the Innovative Product and Bioche Biochemical Award. Uh, Jonathan. And today, Sorry, can I just interrupt? Yes. We can see your uh, your presenter mode. If you could just click on display settings and swap presenter and slideshow view. Okay, let me work out how to do that. Just on on the page with your notes, um, there was a an option to swap. Let's see if that's any better. Um, yeah, if you just want to put that in full screen. Yeah, it's good to get that out of the way. Yeah, per perfect. Thank All you. Right. <laughs> Great. So, sorry for the delay. Um, then we'll crack on. Um, so, I'm going to introduce CleanTech Water's development in the uh, nitrogen removal and biological treatment sector over the past few years. So to set the scene, um, elevated nitrate levels are a major issue around the world. Issues often arise from municipal wastewater treatment, as well as mining or industrial wastewater. Uh, discharging nitrate contaminated water into natural water bodies can lead to eutrophication as a contributing factor to algal blooms that can lead to major fish kill events, um, which can impact waterways and significantly uh, impact communities that depend on those uh, healthy agricultures. Many countries, including China, are introducing strict and nutrient discharge limits uh, to limit environmental impact. Potable water is another sector which is uh, negatively impacted by nitrate pollution. Uh, nitrate contamination of groundwater is a major global health issue and can lead to conditions such as blue baby syndrome and various forms of cancer. Conventional bacterial treatments such as CAS, MBR, BNR uh, can struggle to reach new limits of less than 1 ppm, which are being enforced across the world. And whilst our own batch ion exchange process can reach those, they do produce very large volumes of concentrated waste that does need disposal. So CleanTech's border, CleanTech borders BioClans and BioNet technologies can be implemented in a very number of ways to improve the health of people and the aquatic environment. BioCleanse is a biological technology in which microorganisms are encapsulated in a PVA gel carrier, which uh, maximizes the diffusion rate and protects bacteria from uh, harsh saline conditions, enabling consistently high nitrification and denitrification activity. Innovative coupling of this with our proprietary continuous ion exchange technology, which we call CIF, forms our Bionex product, which is a patent pending uh, integrated system, which allows for consistent nitrate removal to sub one PPM levels in a system which has a very small footprint 
low capital on operating costs and produces a lot less waste than conventional nitrate treatment methods. Continuous ion exchange is used first in this process to intensify the nitrate into a high concentration, and then it's reduced by the biocleans to uh, basically produce a nitrogen gas as the, the final product. Uh, this is a number of benefits, including ultra high recovery uh, and low chemical consumption. So if we take a closer look at the biocleans themselves, uh, these are the encapsulated bacteria, which are selected either for nitrate or ammonia removal, are uh, held within the porous matrix. Uh, and this allows the substrates to easily pass through. And this also results in high activity rates, uh, very low to no, no organism losses, and very low uh, waste sludge production. Uh, the gel carrier looks a bit like a, a contact lens, about five mil in diameter, and has a very high surface area. The unique aspect of the technology is the ability to main, uh, maintain very high efficiency rates in saline conditions. So that's important for uh, considering uh, high strength brines, such as those used in ion exchange re regeneration, where standard free cell bacteria cannot easily function. It's a few nice close ups here of uh, what they look like under SEM imaging. You can see the porous permeable sponge like structure. Um, and this is carefully controlled during manufacture to provide suitable home for these bacterial uh, biological communities to thrive and live. Uh, we manufacture these lenses now in a facility in China, producing around 40 tons of these per year. And we've already got a number of users in that region as well. So if we look into a bit more detail into what nitrification is and denitrification. Uh, so denitrification is the process of converting nitrate to nitrogen gas. Uh, with the biofens bacteria, this occurs in anoxic conditions uh, when oxygen levels are, are low and nitrate becomes the primary substrate. So when bacteria break apart the nitrate, it's first reduced to nitrite, NO2, and then in turn into nitrate, uh, nitrogen gas. A carbon source or organic substrate is typically used uh, within the reaction, uh, such as acetate or methanol. If there are simple chain organics present in the water already, they can also be used as the food source. So this is typically what the reactor will look like that houses these uh, biofens. In the bionics process, this is where we couple that uh, bioclens bio with the continuous ion exchange circuit, which allows us to reach less than one ppm consistently. But the unique uh, countercurrent movement of the resin that we have in our continuous ion exchange process uh, ensures there's minimal effects of fouling, which can be a limiting factor for batch ion exchange and RO processes uh, where bacteria and sludge are present. The biocleanse treated brine coming off this is then filtered uh, with a very small amount of purge, um, typically less than 1% of the flow. In most cases, that waste purge can actually be recycled up, up, um, up front to the if there's an existing wastewater treatment plant, it can go straight up the front, or we can potentially blend that with some of the product. Um, and then we can actually achieve a zero liquid discharge result. Um, salt usage is also minimized. We have a very small amount of top up, since the majority of the brine, over 99% of it, is recycled. So we just keep moving this circuit around, adding nitrate from the uh, exchange with what we, we typically exchange chloride on the resin, using salt, and then that nitrate comes into the biocleanse reactor and forms nitrogen gas. Uh, further research and development we've done in this space um, has enabled us to develop ultra high specific nitrate resins, which does allow us to manage uh, feed waters containing significant competing anions to nitrate in the water, such as uh, waters with very high sulfate to nitrate ratios. So we can actually tune the CIF system to provide a unique uh, sulfate desorption step. This allows us to have complete desorption of the resin and ensures that we can, can consistently reach these uh, low nitrate levels of less than 1 ppm. So here's what a bionics plant would typically look like. On the left you can see a CIF system, which is our continuous resin system, which has a number of columns, typically with adsorption, desorption and wash steps. 
and we, we move the resin between the columns with our lips. The biotone system typically has uh, one or two reactors in series uh, and uses a specific mixing blade design, which is low shear. Other components of the plant typically include uh, process and uh, chemical tanks, dosing systems, electrical and control to fully automate the plant. A uh, flagship full-scale um, 12 megalitre per day plant is currently being constructed for a client in China on the back of some test work we've done. Um, so that's due to be commissioned by the end of the year. We've also been uh, doing a number of pilot trials, um, specifically one in Tianjin we've been doing for uh, about six months to provide a proof of concept for a client who's struggling to reach uh, a new set of low uh, discharge limits that have been enforced on them that they're currently being fined for because their system doesn't work. So our pilot treated up to about 100 cubes a day with a skid mounted uh, continuous ion exchange plant as you can see on the left uh, and two stages of uh, bioreactors with about 10% loading of the biocleanse uh, denitrifiers installed in each. The inside of the reactor you can see in the video on the right um, you can actually see that the, the bacteria in the lenses go brown. This isn't, this isn't sludge, this is actually um, what happens to the bacteria when they're operating at very high levels of removal efficiency. We also use a proprietary self-cleaning screen uh, to keep the bio lenses within the reactor uh, and allow the treated water to pass through. So uh, over the pilot, which we did for about six months in total, um, we were consistently removing nitrate from about 20 ppm coming in to less than 1 ppm, uh, typically undetectable. This actually resulted in a brine, uh, which, would be, which was dissolved off the resin, containing about 200 ppm of nitrate, and that was fed to the biofens reactors. So after a few days of warming up, those uh, bacteria eventually managed to reduce that 200 ppm down to typically less than 10 ppm, which is more than sufficient for us to have full regeneration of the loaded resin uh, as it's returned to the continuous ion exchange system. We were able to uh, optimize the two-stage system uh, that we had by reducing the carbon to nitrate uh, dosing rate. Uh, you can see here we had a step change where we reduced it a little bit too much and then we got it just about right. So this green line is the, the final discharge nitrate and eventually with the, an optimized carbon to nitrate dosing rate, we were able to consistently be under 10 ppm. And then the activity rates of these uh, uh, bacterial colonies, colonies, we can actually uh, look at in terms of um, milligrams of uh, nitrate removed per kilogram of lenses. And we were typically finding that we could get peaks of around 1,000, um, which is very, very high compared to conventional technologies. And just shows the high level of process intensification achieved with these encapsulated bacteria. And we've actually seen a lot higher rates than that as well um, in other example projects where we've only used about 2% loading and the activity rates can be up to five times as much as this. So just to conclude, um, our encapsulated bacteria technology, which we've coupled together with ion exchange in our Bionex process, we believe has a, is going to provide a fundamental shift in how bacteria and resins is applied to water treatment. They're going to be readily employed in the secondary and tertiary wastewater treatment spaces to provide both nitrate and ammonia uh, removal um, to very low levels. So this is going to be a key enabler for recycled water reuse and also discharge compliance. Um, cost of treatment is very low, typically less than 10 cents per cube treated. Uh, and generates significantly less waste or zero waste in some cases uh, where it's possible to recycle those, uh, those streams. And future developments to look out for are um, where we're going to be potentially integrating the nitrate removal step with phosphate removal as well uh, using doped resins. And potentially that can also allow us to recover a, a solid reusable phosphorus product. So yeah, we're not we're not done here yet. We're we're continuing to develop this further and excited to see where it goes. So thank you very much for listening and hope to take any questions or 
we've got time. If not, then I would like to wish all the finalists involved good luck. Thank you very much, Jonathan. It's now time for your questions. So <clears throat> we have actually already one question here. Um, how do we treat the excess bacteria removed from the bioreactor? If you can answer, Jonathan. So the, the, the key thing with the encapsulated bacteria is that the, the bacteria actually stay within the lens. They don't actually leave the lenses at all. Um, if they do, then there's something wrong with the manufacturing process. But it, um, the way that they're manufactured is that the, 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 the bacteria colonies stay within the lenses and all, all the reaction actually takes place in the lens. And so there is no organism loss from those reactors. Thank you very much, Jonathan. The question. And um, I, I, I don't, it, we don't appear to have any more questions. So thank you very much again for getting things started, Jonathan. Let's move to our next finalist. Next up, representing the joint entry from Dow USA, please welcome Scott Bakker. All right, hello. Um, my name is Scott Backer. I represent uh, Dow Chemicals Home and Personal Care Business, and I'll be glad to discuss uh, AccuSol Prime 1 Polymer. It is a new innovation in our um, fight for sustainability in the automatic dishwashing detergent area. So, <clears throat> Actually, as our previous uh, nominee mentioned, uh, a significant amount of eutrophication uh, with regards to uh, nitrate pollution uh, within the area of detergents, uh, a major area of <clears throat> uh, change in the last decade or two has actually been the removal of phosphates from detergents to prevent similar cases of eutrophication. Uh, these changes in builder packages have required a significant amount of new innovations in actually how detergents themselves are built. Uh, providing a, a variety of new issues around um, filming and scale on glassware and uh, within the machines themselves. Uh, as you can see here, uh, scale or the formation of uh, an inorganic film on glassware or other surfaces uh, is actually a function of both chemistry and conditions. Uh, in this case, uh, inorganic salts uh, such as sodium carbonate, sodium silicate, or organophosphonates uh, are present in detergents, and when they become uh, solubilized in the wash bath and exposed to both hard water ions and heat, they can form a variety of different scale types, which will deposit on surfaces. Uh, these can take a variety of appearances, as I'm sure most of us have noticed from our own dishwashers, uh, such as this kind of white chalky calcium carbonate scale, uh, or even more difficult to uh, find and more easy to see, these blue scales, uh, which are commonly composed of either magnesium silicate or calcium organophosphonate. Uh, these are the primary sources of scale or filming on glasses and dishes uh, within ADW. One of the main areas in which we'll use to prevent this type of scale, and not only within home care, but also a variety of different water treatment, boiler and oil and gas applications, uh, are a class of chemicals called dispersants. Uh, in this case, these are water-soluble polyelectrolytes. Uh, not surfactants, uh, and they're both used in laundry and dish uh, and other markets, as we discussed, uh, as primary scale prevention agents. Um, the classical dispersion architecture is based on a polyacrylic acid homopolymer or copolymers of a variety of monomers uh, in order to tune its performance on a variety of scale types. As you can see here, we've got monoacids, uh, such as acrylic acid or methacrylic acid, diacids such as the maleic or itaconic monomers or these um, more hard ion uh, sulfonic acid monomers such as amps or sodium styrene sulfonate uh, commonly when one is trying to fight these kind of bluer uh, more exotic scales uh, these types of hard ions are required in order to prevent them as you can see here uh, comparing the both shine performance and the biodegradability profile of the dispersants on the market today it's very difficult to both get high performance 
and improved biodegradability. You can see here the current materials on the market today uh, in the white column uh, are polyacrylic acid homopolymers or the sulfonated polyacrylates that I showed on the previous slide. These can have a medium to high level of performance, but are really limited to maybe 5 to 10% biodegradability. Uh, in the last decade, a variety of new materials have uh, entered the market. Some of these are of enhanced biodegradability, such as uh, carboxymethylated polysaccharides or polyaspartic acid. Uh, as you can see, there's a lot of uh, what we'll call it green space on this graph, where there have not really been any materials with both enhanced biodegradability and performance, even matching that of the most commoditized uh, polyacrylic acid homopolymer. Accusol Prime 1 polymer uh, was actually designed to handle a variety of scale times with no compromise on performance. As you can see here, uh, preventing calcium carbonate inhibition in solution, you can see that uh, as the water hardness is increased, uh, a polymer, a no polymer control will actually cause uncontrolled growth of calcium carbonate to the point where it would deposit virtually on any surface in a dishwasher. Using the acrylic homopolymers or median level performers, you can see uh, you are able to both delay the onset of crystallization, and once the crystals have been fully formed, uh, you're able to disperse them within the wash vat very well. Accusol Prime 1 polymer, again, even further, is able to uh, delay the onset of crystallization and prevent the crystallites from growing to the point where they can scatter significant amounts of light. Not only does this work on calcium carbonate, but it is also able to uh, handle magnesium silicate and calcium phosphonate scale without losing performance in any one of these three metrics. As you can see from this original slide on US ADW performance results, uh, by washing a glass in a dishwasher for five cycles, a standard ASTM method, uh, if no dispersant polymer is present, you'll have a significant amount of uh, white film or what we would refer to internally as a glowing fuel rod. Uh, use of an acrylic polymer at up to 5% dosage uh, will prevent all of that calcium carbonate formation on glass, plastic, or stainless steel. However, a light amount of, uh, in this case, magnesium silicate scale can be seen as typified by the blue film uh, present on the edges and bulk of the glass. By using Accusol Prime 1 polymer, you are able to prevent both a significant quantity of the calcium carbonate scale, as well as preventing the formation of the bluer magnesium silicate. Again, you're seeing performance on a variety of surfaces that one would use within a dishwasher, glass, plastic, stainless steel. We then move to an even more harsh condition. These European formulations contain a significant amount of the uh, organophosphonate known as HEDP. Uh, this is a threshold inhibitor commonly used in European dish, uh, dishwashing conditions. In this case, we compared the performance of Accusol Prime 1 against not only the moderate performing acrylic homopolymers, but also the premium acrylic sulfonic acid copolymers. In this case, well, once again, the acrylic homopolymer is capable of handling the white scale uh, from calcium carbonate. You can see the growth in here of a blue film, uh, in this case being the calcium organophosphonate scale. The premium acrylic uh, sulfonic polymer is again here capable of handling that organophosphonate um, as it would be also be able to handle silicate scale as seen on the previous slide, uh, but it's unable to handle growth of calcium carbonate after 30 cycles uh, of washing in the dishwasher. Accusol Prime 1 polymer, however, is capable of handling both scales simultaneously, giving a glass that is almost, um, uh, with a clarity level, almost of that of a stripped, unwashed glass. Perhaps most importantly, Accusol Prime 1 polymer was designed not only to maximize performance, but also the amount of biodegradable functional carbon. In this case, over 30% by the OECD 302 method, um, looking at inherent biodegradability. Uh, the product demonstrates what is known as inherent primary biodegradation, uh, which is achievable once a material reaches 20% or the initial degradation state of the polymer. Uh, in fact, in this case, the same chemistry which is improving the biodegradation is also providing the performance benefit. So this is what we mean by functional carbon. We are not just adding chaff in order to uh, pad our biodegradability numbers at the expense of performance. So in conclusion, 
Actosol Prime 1 polymer is a non-sulfidated dispersant designed for premium ADW formulations, both in the US and in Europe. Uh, it is multifunctional and effective against a variety of major scale types. Uh, furthermore, uh, Dow remains committed to the development of high performing biodegradable products. And Accusol Prime 1 is just one example of our recent development efforts. Uh, and I would be glad to take any questions regarding uh, this material or the uh, engineering involved uh, behind this innovation. Thank you very much uh, for that presentation, Scott. So if you'd like to put a question, please get in touch via the questions box. And whilst we wait, um, don't forget there are more IKEMI Award webinars coming up throughout the next couple of weeks. You can find all the dates and times by visiting ikemi.org forward slash global awards. We have one question. Uh, is the product biosourced? In this case, no. It, it's uh, from primarily petrochemically sourced monomers. Um, while some of the monomers involved uh, do have biosourced uh, variants. Um, the requirement to build the biodegradability in this case uh, would not allow us to use a, a fully biosourced material. Thank you, Scott. And we have one more, another question. What is the mechanism behind the performance, please? So in this case, uh, there's a variety of different mechanisms involved in how dispersants work. Um, they can actually help soften the water themselves by chelating um, the individual calcium and magnesium ions in solution. Uh, they're also what we would call crystal growth modifiers. Uh, as crystals begin to grow, uh, they're capable of uh, interacting with these crystals and changing their habit. So instead of, let's say, kind of long uh, needles of calcite, you can get things like uh, bundles of aragonite or vaterite, which are less likely to deposit on surfaces. Uh, further, they can actually adsorb to fully formed crystals as well as um, a variety of charged surfaces, providing charge repulsion and the prevention of deposition. Thank you, Scott. Thank you very much. And we're going to move on to our third finalist of the day. Once again from Dow, please welcome Stephen Kim. Uh, I'm sorry, I was on mute. <laughs> uh, can you see my screen now? Yes, we can yeah, see your right. screen. Mm, okay, nice. Okay, hello. My name is Stephen Kim, working as a uh, Dow Consumer Solution Plus r and in Korea. I'm very honored to be on the finalist for uh, the Alchemy Global Award 2021. My entry title is Dow Cell V8001 Flexible Silicon Adhesive High Performance Silicon Based Material Enabling Breakthrough Foldable uh, Consumer Display Devices. Uh, in the uh, past few years, uh, the flexible welding market has achieved significant technological innovations uh, with the remarkable technical advancements. The global flexible and foldable ready market size is growing at a, a very fast speed, uh, and it's expected to reach uh, $73 billion by the end of uh, 2026, and the market will be growing uh, to an approximate CAGR of 34.4% uh, uh, between 2020 and 2026. Uh, however, we have some remaining challenges for the development of foldable already displays. One of the major challenges is the failure that happens on the inside and outside of the already display hinge part during the uh, 200,000 cycles of folding and unfolding screen tests. Uh, even after 200,000 cycles of folding and unfolding, already display components, including touch panel and cover window, something like that, should be working normally without linkers left uh, 
without wrinkles left on the display hinge part. Uh, Tau Seal V8001 flexible silicon adhesive is two part silicone based ad adhesive solution for uh, foldable and flexible oil display applications. Uh, it's, uh, it's applied to a, a flexible display metal substrate, providing long lasting uh, durability without wrinkles uh, during repeated folding and unfolding over the device's lifetime. Uh, and it can be cured at low temperature to reach mechanical properties that uh, can uh, withstand the dynamic and static uh, folding tests. Uh, OLED display uh, consists of multiple uh, layers, uh, such as plastic cover window, uh, flexible touch sensor, OLED, and metal substrate with optical, electrical, and mechanical functions. Uh, in the foldable OLED structure, V8001 is uh, used to uh, fill the uh, hinge part of uh, where uh, the metal substrate located behind the OLED layer is folded. Uh, the purpose of V8001 uh, uh, is to uh, support a thin foldable OLED panel and to make elastic recovering force even uh, after repeated folding and unfolding of the OLED uh, device. Uh, the method of using uh, V8001 uh, mainly uses a screen printing process that coats the, the etched area and uh, the required specific area by dispensing V8001 to an etched metal substrate and, and then um, pushing it with a skid blade. And in addition to the screen printing process, roll-to-roll uh, -roll process and injection process, uh, injection process can be used. Uh, we have uh, five key benefits of using V8001 for, for flexible and foldable OLED displays. Uh, the first benefit is a uh, superior processability with a uh, lower viscosity for faster fluid in uh, dispensing and uh, mixing processes. Uh, the second is the high adhesion to the metal substrate for uh, the durability and uh, quality of the foldable display. And uh, the third is long working time at room temperature for a uh, process window control. And fourth is uh, excellent folding durability with improved elongation and tensile strength of the product for increasing the folding uh, durability without inorganic fillers. The last one is a high rarity under harsh conditions of thermal cycling and high uh, temperature and humidity. Um, foldable displays are uh, not limited of a lot not limited to some of the specific applications. It can be used for not only mobile and tablet devices, but also automotive on display devices. Uh, based on the reason, a liability test of the V8001 was conducted under uh, more severe conditions than uh, normal conditions. Uh, to uh, compare the liability performance of V8001, we chose filler loaded silicone rubber and polyurethane foam film because uh, they are uh, actually candidates considered for the hinge material. In the level test at uh, 105 degrees for uh, 1,000 hours, as, as you can see, uh, we, uh, 8001 shows the lowest uh, change in hardness, elongation, tensile strength, and adhesive performance. Uh, polyurethane foam film shows the worst material with the large a property change in high temperature test. Uh, in the Larry test at uh, negative 40 degrees for four uh, 1,000 hours, uh, V8001 looks like a perfect material um, with less than 1% performance change in hardness, elongation, tensile strength, and adhesion. Uh, Polyurethane foam film shows the worst uh, material with a big property change even in low temperature uh, test. Under high temperature and high humidity test for uh, 1,000 hours, uh, VE 8001 showed a small change in uh, physical uh, properties, uh, while poly uh, ureton foam film showed a large change in physical uh, properties. 
in in the uh, thermal cycle test for 1,000 cycles, uh, the change in adhesion strength was um, bigger than in the other uh, test conditions. Uh, however, uh, the test results show that uh, VE8001 is a robust material compared to other uh, materials. Uh, the dynamic forging test is one of the essential uh, tests required for uh, foldable displays. Uh, the test results show uh, how the material changes due to repeated compressive and uh, tensile stresses. Uh, as a result of the dynamic test of 200,000 cycles, the, the, ten, the tensile strength and elongation of V8001 did not change and, um, and the polyurethane foam filament uh, silicon loaded uh, rubber uh, did not withstand the indio didn't endure the stress change in the folding um, test. Um, before reaching uh, 1,000, uh, 100,000 cycles, the polyurethane foam film and uh, silicone rubber uh, uh, could not uh, endure and uh, they were actually uh, torn. Uh, the stable result of V8001 in the dynamic uh, level test can be uh, attributed to its low glass transition temperature and stable uh, elastic recovery be behavior. Uh, we 8001 is working based on the uh, heat cure system with vinyl functional siloxan and silicon hydrogen functional cross-linker, including uh, platinum catalyst. Uh, good elongation and tensile strength are very important for superior uh, folding durability. So uh, usually in organic fillers are used to reinforce the silicon network. However, when the filler is applied uh, in a very thin thickness, it couldn't make a negative impact like scratches on the uh, very thin hinge uh, surface. Uh, then it could reduce the folding durability. Uh, to solve the uh, problem, we A1001 uh, uses, uh, use, uh, uses uh, silicon resin instead of inorganic filler uh, for excellent folding uh, durability performance. By uh, introduce, uh, by introducing silicon resin into the uh, formulation of VE8001, it, it optimizes uh, the energy disp dissipation uh, function in the hinge part and achieve, uh, it achieved excellent folding durability. In 2015, Dao announced the uh, 2000, uh, 2025 sustainable force, a set of 10 year uh, course driving the transition to a sustainable planet and society. Uh, this is the company's third set of sustainability course uh, based on its previous two uh, decades of course uh, since uh, 1995. So EHNS course in 2000, 2005 resulted in $5 billion in waste, water, energy, and safety related savings. Uh, sustainable course in 2015 uh, focused on providing more sustainable product and solution addressing on global challenges related to food waste, energy, sustainable water supply and health. Uh, over the next decades, uh, DAO will continue to reduce its own operational footprint and uh, deliver uh, a blueprint for a uh, sustainable planet and uh, society. And based on the uh, DAO's long-term sustainability goals, we 8001 has features that meet the sustainable goals uh, to improve environmental aspects and reduce waste of energy and resources. Uh, the, the large achievement and success for the innovative product development was made uh, by cross-functional collaboration and um, diverse teams. So I would like to uh, take uh, this opportunity to thank everyone involved in the innovative product development. Uh, th thank you uh, very much for giving me the opportunity to represent the team and uh, share our assumptions. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen, for your presentation. We'll once again pause for questions. You know the drill by now. Please type your questions into the questions box. And while I give you a moment on that, 
the winner of this award will have a chance to lift the second prize before the end of the month. All of our team award winners qualify as finalists for our top prize, the Outstanding Achievement in Chemical and Process Engineering Award. We'll be announcing the winner of that award on Friday, 15 October. So we don't appear to have any questions. Thank you very much again, Stephen. We have still four more finalists to hear from before we announce our award winners. So let me introduce our next speaker from Johnson Murphy. It's Harry Claxton. Hi. So, um, Thank you for this um, opportunity to uh, showcase our recent innovation of a new process to make hexandiol from a divic acid. It was also a finalist in the industry project award category, and I won't repeat that presentation, but instead we'll talk about the innovation challenges. I work for Johnson Matty, who are organized around shaping a new era of clean energy, achieving more from less, clean air for all, and helping people live longer and healthier lives. It's a company I'm proud to work for. I work in process technology licensing, where the focus is now on improving the sustainability of producing the materials we all consume. I'm a technology manager looking after a suite of related ester hydrogen technologies, including the new hexane dial process. Within Johnson Matty, we have all the skills and capabilities needed to develop a new chemical process from concept through to operation, including developing and manufacturing catalysts, and you'll hear a bit more detail about that from my colleague Norman in the next presentation, um, through to design, building, and operating mini plants, and performing scale-up test work. The close collaboration between chemists, engineers, and sales is essential for both technical and commercial success. Innovation isn't just about novelty, it's also about useful application and creating value for the customer. The hexane dial process development was a recent example where we were able to take a process from concept to successful license and startup in a very short period of time. Now, innovation is hard. We, we see the winners, but history is littered with the, the much more numerous forgotten failures. Um, so successful innovation is all about managing risk. Um, and there's a risk to moving into new markets. There's also a risk to moving into new technology. And the risk is greatest when you're trying to apply unfamiliar technology into, into new markets. But there's a third dimension is the size of the innovation. Is it incremental or radical? And if you've got multiple innovations um, in, in different process steps, um, then it gets riskier still. Now, now Jay and were able to be successful with the hexane dial development because we understood the adjacent markets of butane dial process technology licensing. We, so we understood the hexane dial product requirements and also what was required of our product, you know, the process design uh, and licensing terms that were needed for success. And also we were able to adapt technology that was familiar to us, such as our reactive distillation technology for the esterification step and our vapor phase hydrogenation technology. We understood the chemistry, we understood the catalysts, and we had developed the analytical techniques. We had engineered similar technology, including scale-up test work, to do the chemistry on an industrial scale. There was a great deal of development work required to adapt and apply these to the hexane dial process, but we could build on what we already had. And this capability enabled us to deliver a successful first project. So this slide just shows the chemistry of the process. Um, first, the adipic acid is dissolved in, in methyl, and then it's esterified. Esterifying the adipic acid, um, first to dimethyl adipate, allows cheaper carbon still to be used in the hydrogenation section. And the esterification actually takes place in two steps. The monoester is formed autocatalytically, but forming the diester requires an acidic acid resin. Then the hydrogenation is performed over a fixed bed of catalyst in the vapor phase. Um, and this controls the temperature rise and the residence times, um, leading to low byproduct make and maximizing the yield, as well as reducing the cost and energy consumption of the purification section. Uh, a less hazardous non-chrome catalyst is used for the reaction, 
And as you can see, the methanol is regenerated, an example of chemical looping. And this is just a, um, a slide showing the overall hexane dial process. So the recycled methanol is used to dissolve the adipic acid as well as performing the esterification. Small makeup of methanol is required to make up for, for losses to byproducts. The ester is then vaporized in hydrogen and then hydrogenated over a fixed bed of catalyst. The methanol is then separated by distillation for recycle and other byproducts removed to achieve a high purity product. We were able to adapt our reactive distillation technology developed for related process technologies for, for the esterification step. This allows us to combine over a dozen steps of reaction and separation to drive the reaction to the high levels of conversion required for the esterification. Uh, and the pictures on this slide show the development of the, of the design. Um, initial benchtop tests were followed by small scale continuous tests as shown on, on the left, followed by mini plant operation, and then hydraulic uh, tests, uh, managing the scale up risk, allowing a 200,000 time scale up from the mini plant operation straight to a commercial plant. Now, while we needed to perform the lab scale tests and operate the mini plants to develop and validate the design for the hexane dial process, we didn't need to repeat all the tests for the scale up risk mitigation as we had a, a number of these um, large scale um, reactors operating and validating the design. And we didn't need to re-engineer um, the detail of the equipment design, such as the online catalyst replacement system. And this all significantly reduced the time and cost of the development as well as reducing the technical risk. And of course, the credit for the hexane dial process goes to the huge team of people. And I'm, I'm just fortunate to be the one to represent them at these awards. Um, and I have to give credit too to the people who helped provide the foundations for the hexane dial development from the development of related technologies. Um, they're all too numerous to mention by name. Um, as process innovation is a team game and requires experienced and skilled people for success. And of course, Johnson and Matthew also collaborate with others to complement our cap capabilities and, and knowledge from universities and research institutions for, for the fundamental science to large multinational chemical companies who better understand the market and may build the first commercial reference plant. Combining ideas and capabilities is a key part of innovating. And as I said earlier, innovating a chemical process is hard. In a chemi complex chemical process, there are so many things that can go wrong and, and they all have to go right. With R&D, by definition, we don't know the results of our experiments or tests before we perform them. And it's, it's not just that acquiring the data to correctly model the process and specify equipment is difficult and takes a lot of skill, but it's easy to generate misleading data or simply not, ask, not know to ask the right questions. Oh, and perform the right tests, the, the unknown unknowns, as Donald Rumsfeld called them. Um, so I'd like to congratulate all the other finalists for, for their achievements in, in producing in, in innovative products. Um, our first li licensed 30,000 uh, 30, ton a year hexane dial plant was successfully started up in 2019. And, and we've just finished the design for the second licensed plant of the same capacity um, both plants in China. Um, we're only successful in Johnson Matty um, because we have had a lot of practice over many decades developing and improving process technology and we work hard at maintaining that corporate memory and capability which is a good excuse to show the list of technologies we license while I, I end with thanking you again for the opportunity to showcase our innovative um, hexane dial process. Thank you. Thank you very much, Harry. We'll now move on to questions and answers. So if you'd like to get in touch, please type it into the questions box as usual. And we actually have um, the first question. What is the advantage of the new process with existing process? Well, we were actually um, developing a new um, process to reach a new product. Um, I'm not entirely familiar with other ways to make hexane dial before our process, but ours, um, I think, is the first large scale continuous process to make hexane dial from a divic acid. 
Thank you. Uh, another question. Uh, can biocatalysis process uh, could be a future competing process? Um, certainly in in other dials, so for example in butane dial, um, there are people are trying to develop technology to um, um, make that um, uh, butane dial um, from bio, using bioorganisms. Um, in terms of the, the the catalysis with the temperatures and uh, uh, conditions we, we require, um, you know, the, the traditional metal catalysts, uh, active metal catalysts um, seem to work very well. Thank you very much, Harry. Uh, we don't appear to have any other questions, so it's time to move on to our next presentation. It's our second Johnson Matthew presentation. Please welcome Norman, Norman McLeod. Hi Norman, just to let you know that we were seeing your presenter view there. That's great, thank you. Okay, thanks. Okay, well, good morning everyone. <clears throat> uh, my name is Norman McLeod and I'm a research and development manager for Johnson Matthey based in Billingham in the UK. And I'm going to talk today about our new highly stable methanol synthesis catalyst, Catalco 51102. Uh, first, just a, a few words to add to Harry's introduction to JM. Um, our vision is for a, a world that's cleaner and healthier both today and for future generations. Uh, we use our cutting edge science working in collaboration with our customers to make a real difference to the world around us. JM is a science and technology company with expertise across many fields, uh, several of which were employed in the development of uh, Catalco 51102. Core competencies such as uh, catalysis and advanced materials, product formulation and scale up, uh, characterization and modeling through to process optimization. So the successful delivery of this project, uh, as was also the case uh, with the, the previous project uh, described by Harry, uh, involved a multifunctional team of chemists, engineers, and uh, commercial colleagues, all working closely together over several years. As I'm sure you're aware, methanol is a, a major commodity chemical with uh, somewhere in the region of 100 million metric tons being produced annually. It is used to make a wide variety of derivative chemicals and associated downstream products and uh, it's also increasingly being used as a fuel, uh, either as methanol itself or as a blend. And indeed, uh, approximately a third of global methanol production uh, currently is ultimately intended for fuel applications. Uh, one particular area of focus uh, in this regard uh, at the moment is the potential use of methanol as a substitute for marine diesel. There is also significant interest in the future use of methanol as a hydrogen carrier and as a source of green fuels and chemicals via sustainably sourced hydrogen and CO2. Uh, and I'll come back to that a little later. Now to provide a, a little context for the recent development, uh, it's worth discussing briefly the, the history of the low pressure methanol process. Uh, which was developed on our site in Birmingham in the mid 1960s, uh, employing the first commercialized copper zinc alumina methanol synthesis catalyst 511. And the first plant using this catalyst had a capacity in the region of 400 tons per day. Uh, and since that time, there have been improvements in both catalyst performance and process design with world scale plants now uh, commonly exceeding capacities of 5,000 tonnes per day. 
And since the 1960s, uh, JM have introduced a series of ever more active and physically robust catalysts. And we are now on our 15th uh, iteration. However, the single biggest improvement that we've made to the performance of the catalyst over those 50 or so years is that associated with 51102. And this highlights that even with uh, mature technologies such as this, it is still possible to make step out improvements. So how was this achieved? Well, in the past, uh, the focus has tended to be on improving the initial activity of the catalyst and then assume that any activity advantage uh, will be retained over the useful operating life of the material. However, as you can see in this indicative activity versus time plot, methanol synthesis catalysts tend to lose a large proportion of their activity with time online. So with 51102, um, we decided to try a different approach. Uh, and instead of looking to improve the initial activity, we targeted improving the long-term stability of the catalyst. Uh, now, the initial R&D phase of the project involved the development of systems and protocols for uh, accelerated aging of candidate formulations, followed by performance validation on a pilot scale side stream unit. And I'll go into more detail on the development process at tomorrow's uh, research project event. Uh, but today I want to focus more on how this uh, innovative product has product has performed in customers' plants. Uh, and I should perhaps mention that I, I can't really go into detail today in terms of the specifics of the, uh, the new formulation. Okay, so the, the first commercial charge of 51102 has now been online for over two years. Uh, and this figure shows the activity of 51102 over time uh, at this plant compared to the activity of the previous charge that was installed at the same facility. And that previous charge was also JM material. It was the best of our prior generation catalysts. Uh, and the improved stability of the new product is, uh, is clearly apparent here. Now we can take these two activity versus time profiles and use them uh, to generate a ratio uh, uh, which give us a, a relative measure of the performance uh, as shown here. And this illustrates that after two years online, the relative activity advantage uh, of the new product has reached a factor of about 1.6, uh, which is obviously a huge uh, improvement over the prior generation catalyst. And also we expect this activity advantage to continue to increase with further time online. In a separate facility, a second, uh, much larger charge of the new catalyst uh, has been online now for about 10 months. And this is also showing the expected uh, improvement in performance. The data we have so far suggests that the relative activity benefit has reached a factor of about 1.3 after um, about seven months online. And again, we anticipate that this should continue to increase with further time on stream. Uh, in addition to these two references, we have a, a third charge of Catalyst, which will go online shortly, and then a fourth charge, which will be installed uh, in the early part of next year. Another exciting prospect for this development, <clears throat> excuse me, is in the area of uh, green fuels and chemicals production via CO2 hydrogenation. And having a stable catalyst uh, is potentially even more important in this duty due to the high partial pressure of water produced as a byproduct, uh, which tends to accelerate deactivation. Uh, we have found in our lab tests that uh, variants of this development perform significantly better in these duties than prior generation catalysts. So to summarize some of the advantages of the new development, uh, it can increase productivity on existing plants by maintaining high conversions over time. Uh, on an example, 3,000 uh, ton per day plant, uh, the cumulative extra methanol produced could generate additional revenues of up to $50 million over four years. 
the new catalyst can provide a significant significant improvement in operating life, uh, perhaps up to double that of existing catalysts. And it also provides opportunities for further process optimization via new plant designs. And uh, finally, the availability of highly stable catalysts should facilitate development of green routes to fuels and chemicals via CO2 hydrogenation, uh, delivering on GM's vision for a cleaner and healthier world. Uh, okay, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Norman. Once again, we will pause for a moment and give you a chance to submit a question in the questions box. And if you've been suitably inspired by today's presentations, it might be time to start thinking about your own awards for next year. Keep an eye on the IKME Awards website for more details but we plan to open for entries in early March 2022. I don't see that we have any questions, so it's time to move on. So thank you very much, Norman. Oh, sorry, we actually have just one question. Um, can we expect the catalyst for green methanol will when, uh, excuse me, when we, can we expect the catalyst for green methanol will come? Well, we're already, uh, our current generation materials are already being used in uh, CO2 to methanol applications. Uh, so this development we see as being uh, an improvement over um, over the existing generation of, uh, of catalysts. Thank you very much, Norman. Um, so we can move on. Um, next up, we have our joint entry from Chezang High Matter New Materials, Nimbo University China and University College London. Please welcome Yanshan Li. Hello, can you see my slides? Yes, we can. All right, okay. Thank um, you, Mara. Just need to put them into presentation mode. That's great. Thank you. Excuse me. Can I start my? Yes, that's ahead. fine now. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, um, dear colleagues, thank you for this opportunity to share with our recent progress on large-scale application of uh, zeolite membranes. My presentation is mainly to provide a clear picture about why a continuous production of zeolite membrane is desired and what we have done in the scope of industry application of zeolite membranes uh, in renewable energy and new energy. Uh, chemical separation is one of the most important activities in chemical industries. Nowadays, distillation is most widely used in chemical industries for molecule separation and accounts for 10% of the global energy consumption. People are looking for an approach for molecule separation that does not rely on phase equilibrium, but with the ability to recognize individual molecules like Maxwell Ghost, who is a doorkeeper of a molecular, molecule-sized door. Zeolites are such a kind of materials. They are Macroporous crystals with abundant nanopores. Uh, taking ZS5 as an example, the total length of the nano channel of one gram zeolite might be around four times the Earth to sun distance. But only when zeolite materials are made into membrane form, it is worth of the name of molecular sieve. For practical use, uh, zeolite separating layers are usually coated on the surface of a porous uh, ceramic spot, taking LTA zeolite membrane as an example, as shown in this left hand figure. If the zeolite layer is defect free, an extremely high separation performance for organic water separation could be achieved, relying on molecular sieving function. There are two trade-offs for membrane separation applications. The first one is performance trade-off. 
that is the trade-off between permeability and selectivity. Zeolite membranes, in terms of water separation from organic, have overcome this trade-off very well. And uh, <clears throat> the second trade-off is uh, uh, the, the trade-off between cost and performance. Uh, Zeolite, uh, 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 this uh, between performance and cost, we have overcome this uh, trade-off by our unique continuous production by microwave process. So why continuous production is necessary? Because it can reduce cost and enhance productivity, improve reproducibility. For example, reverse osmosis membrane is commercially produced in a continuous way because the membrane formation process, that is uh, interfacial polymerization can be achieved can be accomplished in seconds. But in the case of zeolite membranes, it is difficult, it is different because usually hydrothermal synthesis is used. Synthesis time uh, of several hours is needed. More than 10 years ago, uh, we found that microwave synthesis is a very efficient way to shorten the synthesis time to several minutes and to reduce the defects. So, it makes it possible for continuous production of zeolite membranes. So based on our experience accumulated on the designing and the using of large microwave oven, we have succeeded in the construction of a continuous production line for zeolite membranes. It, it includes automatic feeding system, a 50 meters long microwave tunnel reactor, and automatic post treatment system. Compared with uh, commercial new batch synthesis, the manufacturing path, the manufacturing path rate increased from around 80% uh, to above 99%, and the single line capacity increased by eight times, and the membrane cost reduced by 44%. So all of these improvements will remarkably expand the application of zeolite membranes. By far, we could pr provide different types of zeolite membranes for different applications. And we also provide customized, uh, customized ones for special application. This is application fields of our membrane. Uh, 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 they can be used for various dehydration. And uh, in the following, I will show two cases. One is uh, uh, dehydration of ethanol in renewable energy industries. And the other one is dehydration of uh, NMP. Where is NMP? Yeah, NMP in the lithium battery industries. As we know, bioethanol is widely used in US and Brazil as a renewable energy. And also in China, the government also launched a, an ambitious plan to promote the use of bioethanol. Before mixing with gasoline, the ethanol must be dewatered. This provides a huge market for zeolite membrane, but we have to compete with pressure swing absorption technology. And PSA is mature and cheap and durable, so the, uh, the, 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 uh, the task is difficult. Based on the OPEX analysis, uh, 13 to 37% uh, of energy saving could be achieved by using zeolite membrane replacing PSA process. The higher the water content, uh, the greater the energy saving, uh, but this associates with the increased membrane area. So membrane cost became a key factor. And this is what exactly what we do now to reduce the cost of the membrane by a continuous production way. So thanks to the to our cost competitive membrane, we already delivered a typical case of ultra pure electronic grade ethanol project at Shandong IQ Group uh, last year. And as far as we know, this is the first uh, case of uh, ultra deep dewatering of ethanol to less than 200 ppm of water in such larger scale uh, 
10,000 ton per year and in the world. So we are the first and the only membrane supplier for electronic grid solvent purification in China as well as in the world. Another emerging market we are approaching is the lithium battery industry. NMP is widely used in the electrode coating process. Nowadays, the collect, uh, the collect NMP, uh, spent NMP from the coating line will be transported to the NMP producer. After purification using distillation technology, the NMP will be transported back to the lithium battery factory and reused. This accounts for a significant amount of the cost for lithium battery. Therefore, an on-site uh, recycling of AMP using energy efficient membrane technology is desired. But the challenge is that for electronic grade AMP, the water content should be less than 100%, 100 ppm. And also, uh, it's, it means that the membrane defects should be eliminated to a great extent and also a large mem a large amount of membrane area is needed so the mem the membrane must be cost effective and we conducted a pilot scale test at china aviation lithium battery in 2019 and the purified nmp after dewatering by our membrane system met the uh, standard of uh, electronic grade nmp this is the first time that ultra-pure, uh, deep dehydration of AMP by membrane was realized. We expected to deliver an industry AMP project with a capacity of 2,000 tons per year in China in this year. So at last, uh, this table summarized the advantages of parameters membrane in terms of membrane element, membrane module, and membrane system. So we hope that our low cost and long life membrane could gain a wide applications in mega scale in the future. So thank you, thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much. Jan, so if you have a question about what you've just seen, please get in touch now via the questions box. I give you a moment for that. We have um, one question. Question: What would be the maximum amount of water that this technology could take? Okay, and uh, because uh, only water can permit through the membrane, so. Uh, in terms of economy, uh, the water content should be uh, is usually less than 15 percent. But uh, we can also handle of the feed with water content up to uh, 50 percent. So, yeah, the the maximum water content is 50 percent. Thank you very much for the answer. We don't appear to have any other question. Question. So it's time to move on, and we have reached our last presentation of the day. From Saudi Aramco, please welcome Hala Al Sadek. Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. It is an honor to be a finalist in this prestigious competition. My name is Hala Sadig, and I'm a petroleum scientist working at Saudi Aramco's Upstream Advanced Research Center. Today, I'll be presenting our in-house developed technology, the field, the field scale acoustic oil water fine separator for sustainable produce water management. Joining me in this project are my colleague Amr Amr Fatah and his Felix. To start, this technology represents an innovation that was built upon a simple and scientifically proven phenomenon that helps solve major global issues associated with oil production operations and the supply of clean water in remote locations and developing communities. It is a versatile, low energy, and resolves several limitations associated with current technologies to add a number of advantageous functions. The need for removing suspended solids and emulsified oil contaminants from water is common across several strategic applications and is globally growing. 
particularly in the oil and gas industry, where it poses many challenges faced today when it comes to managing produced water. These challenges include the increasing amounts of produced water as the fields in the conventional sector are maturing along the need to expand facilities, which requires accommodating this water trend. And this would cost a lot um, as the frequency of treating disposal wells um, will be also rising. Currently, physical water treatment technologies such as membrane filtration and hydrocyclone are costly, energy intensive, and cannot be tuned in situ. We capitalize on this window of opportunity to innovate a technology that is simple and based on a scientifically proven phenomena to help solve this major global issue associated with oil production operations. Our technology is versatile, low in energy, and resolves several limitations associated with current technologies and adds a number of advantageous functions, and as mentioned. The technology helps to drive the oil production operations towards becoming increasingly sustainable. Our technology uses no moving parts and separates and removes small oil droplets and solid particles from flowing fluid streams without any flow intervention, thereby reducing the frequency of downtimes, maintenance, and any replacing parts. It all is based on the acoustic separation technique, which are based on creating a standing wave pattern within a fluid in which a dispersed phase, for example, any solid particles or immiscible fluid droplets travel. We then take the time average direct acoustic radiation arising from these uh, for the repeating pressure gradients and drive the dispersed phase to either go into the nodal or the antinodal planes within the acoustic field. This all depends on the compressibility and the density relative to the carrier fluid. In other words, in a standing mechanical wave, the particles will selectively migrate towards either the pressure nodes or the anti-nodes, depending on their compressibility and density compared to that of the continuous phase. And the standing waves are uh, in the acoustic parameters, for example, the amplitude and the frequency can be tuned and changed instantaneously to modify the characteristic of the standing wave patterns. To see it in action, the acoustic radiation force directs the dispersed particles that are sufficiently less compressible in, uh, in the carrier fluid, for example, the solid fines uh, in the water to the pressure nodal planes. And these are that are uh, more compressible than the carrier fluid, for example, the oil droplets in the water will be directed towards the pressure antinodal planes. We put this acoustophoristic phenomena at work and developed the acoustic oil water fine separator. We designed a sequence of standing acoustic waves with decreasing loop numbers in the flow direction, which allows us to uh, coalesce the oil particles and separate them from the water. By doing so, it allows us to separate the oils and the fines simultaneously without any flow intervention or pressure drop. This makes it uniquely uh, able to be tunable to a wide range of water cuts, does not require any preset flow, and can be remotely controlled. We successfully patented the acoustic oil water fine separator and published our proof of concept work at the Society of Petroleum Engineers Production and Operations Journal, as well as at the Abu Dhabi International Petroleum Exhibition and Conference. We also performed lab experiments using direct microscopic visualization in a microfluidic channel, which demonstrated that this instantaneous separation of micron-sized oil droplets and solid fine particles from water can be made by exciting the proper acoustic standing wave uh, field in this flow channel. So the oil droplets and the solid fines were separated by a distance of lambda over four, lambda here being the wavelength of the acoustic wave, uh, which was the expected separation between the pressure nodal and antinodal planes. So as you can as you can see here in this short clip, solid um, well, I was hoping you could see the clip, but we have solid uh, silica fine particles that are instantaneously concentrated in the pressure nodal planes and the oil droplets in the pressure antinodal planes, uh, which which was just as we predicted by theory, proving the concept at the micro scale. We also verify the concept at the macroscopic scale, as you can see here in this four by four section, uh, cross section from uh, the stream. Again, in this case, the oil droplets uh, were instantaneously concentrated at the uh, pressure antinodal planes. So you can see here we have the duodecane oil droplets, and we are subjecting the flow to acoustic signal, and you can see them lined, lining up in bands, which uh, is in this case the um, antinodal planes. And um, we have this arrow here to, to showcase where the oil is. Um, as part of the development of this acoustic separation technology, we went from the concept to the field scale level, which involved a detailed lab work uh, 
and a lab scale proof of concept experiment, which was followed by many iterations of engineering designs and eventually finally a fully functional prototype at the desired field scale level. So the field scale prototype resembles a metal conduit. It's a four inch by four inch in cross section and is comprised of six ultrasonic standing wave stations that are 1.5 feet each. Um, the rearrangeable stations have frequencies ranging from 90 to 240 kilohertz and are arranged in the order of decreasing frequency in the direction of the flow. This arrangement uh, ensures that the separated oil is concentrated in the midplane of the flow conduit. Uh, the, in the bottom here, we show that the prototype was tested using an oil and water emulsion with a 5 to 10 percent oil volume, flowing at a rate of 500 a barrel per day, with the oil droplets being in the range of one millimeter in diameter. The test results showed striking agreement with the anticipated performance. You can see here the oil droplets were separated and concentrated in the pressure antinode planes as they pass through each uh, ultrasonic station. And as the number of loops in each station decreases the, in the direction of the flow, the oil drops eventually coalesce near the midplane of the flow before exiting the last station. This technology is extremely versatile. Right now, we are we currently formed a multidisciplinary team and are working on using the acoustic separator as a surface separation tool to reduce the retention time of the produced water uh, at the uh, water oil separation plant in the oil and gas industry. Here, we can reduce the cost of reconfigure, reconfiguring the GOS to accommodate any increase in water trends. And not only that, this tool can also be used as a filterless purification tool to remove any small, sol uh, small solids and oil particulates from the produced water. Uh, this is in order for it to be uh, re-injected into disposal wells without any uh, formation damage. This tool can also be utilized in the future as a downhole oil water fine separator to reduce the volumes of the produced water pumped at the surface, which would increase the well productivity. The clean water can be injected downhole or to a non-producing formation after remo removing any hydrocarbon uh, residues. So the acoustic separation tool is not only increased the oil water ratio in producing wells, but could also reduce the risk of pore clogging and formation contamination should the water be injected back into the formation. Overall, the acoustic oil water fine separator concept provides environmental benefits as it consumes minimal energy. In this case, the energy is only needed to move the dispersed phase as opposed to moving the entire body of the fluid mixture. The savings in the energy consumption and CO2 emissions are thus very substantial. It also reduces the cost for pumping and treating massive volumes of produced water and the health and environmental hazards associated with handling such volumes. It also allows us to reuse our produced water for any upstream and downstream applications and reduces the need for using uh, increasing natural water resources. It also has financial benefits by reducing the frequency of down times, maintenance and replacing parts, as well as the volume of produced water and any necessary surface facilities modifications that would handle such volumes. Um, of course, it will also reduce any corrosion and scale issues of the production pipes. Thank you all for listening. I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Hala. We have um, actually uh, a question. Can we estimate the energy loss due to the ultrasonic acoustics? Sure. So you're asking about the energy loss when you're utilizing the ultrasonic acoustics in terms of how much energy is saving if you were to compare it to using um, another technology. So for example, if we were to apply downhole, um, let's say you are injecting one kilogram of um, CO2 per barrel, and if you were to kind of extrapolate this to, for example, say 100 wells, your uh, savings would be up anywhere near 500,000 uh, tons of CO2 per year of uh, carbon dioxide. This is in terms of, um, if you're thinking about it, in terms of carbon emissions. So the energy savings also would, would be resulting from the elimination of the pressure drops, uh, which in this case would be uh, dropping uh, the pressure by up to 3,000 psi. So that's like four kilowatt hour per barrel um, of energy. Thank you very much, Halam. We don't appear to have any other questions. So it's time to move on and we have reached the moment that we've been all waiting for. It's time to find out the winner of the IKM Innovative Product Award sponsored by the Chemical Engineer. Before we do that, I'd like to thank all our finalists for joining us today and for taking the time to share more details about the fine work. I'm sure you will all agree a fine diverse range of work on show. Let's start announcing our highly commended entries and they are Clean Tech Water and Don Johnson Maffey. Well done to everyone associated with those entries. 
but now it's time to announce the award winner. Ladies and gentlemen, the winner of the iChemy Innovative Product Award sponsored by the Chemical Engineer is the joint entry from Chezang High Matter New Materials, Nimbo University China and University College London. Congratulations to everyone who worked on the winning entry. Yansho, I hope uh, you're still with us. If we can get you uh, back yeah. on screen or on the microphone, can you tell us how does it feel to be an iChemy Award winner? Yes, I'm so excited. Yeah, uh, we are we are greatly honored and happy to receive this award with the cooperation of Zhejiang High Matter, Ningbo University, and the University College London. And I would like to express my sincere appreciations to each team members from these three organizations, especially to Dr. Tong from Ningbo, from University College London for his professional work and great support during our cooperation. So thank you all again. Thank you. Well, congratulations to everyone who worked on the winning, winning entry. And uh, congratulations uh, once again. And thank you to everyone for joining us today. And especially uh, all our finalists. We've still more IKEMI Awards webinars to come over the next uh, few weeks. We'll be back this afternoon to announce the winner of the Business Startup Award. But that's all for now. Thank you and thank you for joining us.